Baseball is dead. Rest in peace. It's a Wednesday. We're in the first week of September. And you know what, Dallas? I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to try to compartmentalize the mental breakdown that I'm going through right now. Ooh. Uh, uh do you need a you need a little safe space right now? You need a little no. uh, a little sit down in the trust tree? Mm-mm. No. I think I'm <clears throat> No. You sure? I, because no, because I was thinking about it this morning. Are you sure? I I'm positive. I was thinking about it this morning. Okay. And this is a baseball show. It's an MLB show. It and is. There are plenty of baseball fans out there that are tuning into us being like, man, I can't wait to hear what the boys have to say about my team. Like it's, it's an exciting time. It's the last month of the season. Some teams are sitting pretty. Uh, some teams are fighting for a spot and that's exciting. Uh, my team, Jake, our team, I don't think it's they're They're not one of those teams anymore. They're just not. But I'm not going to fight. Yes, I'm not going to let that get in the way of pumping up and showing excitement for the teams that are going to play postseason baseball this year because the Boston Red Sox are not one of them. Um, oh, that is, I can, I can that, put aside my sadness. I can put aside, you know, um, hey, the yes, Dallas. As long as we're putting things places, do you want to put them to bed? Is it too early to put them to bed? I mean, you can put them to bed and you can just move on with this. And I say this with all the love in my heart, Jerry. Yeah. If you can find that place right now, if we can mm-hmm. tuck them in, right? They got their milk and cookies. They want some milk and cookies. Give them their milk mm-hmm. and cookies yeah. and put them to bed. And then we can just move on, right? Like you can just, you can take that breath. It's that relief. They're in bed. We've got the Netflix. We're ready to go. Like we can, we can do that. I think Did you if see you that tweet last night, by the way, the, about the Netflix guys. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, they just <laughs> stopped. They stopped showing up like a month ago. <laughs> They're like, yeah, you know what? I think we've got enough here. I think yeah. we've got enough. Uh, the band is still playing, but uh, we got a dinghy on the other side of this thing, so we're gonna go ahead and jump off now. Yeah. You keep playing though, and uh, I heard it's cold. Hold your breath. Maybe you'll catch a door. Maybe there's room on that door for you. If not, hang with them. <laughs> hey, if that ain't the best testament to how long of a grind 162 is, huh? <laughs> when Netflix taps out, they're like, yeah. can't camera this, crews dude. like can't do it. <laughs> yeah, I, ha- I had 83 games in me. Jay, I just, was- just want to know the deciding process of like why the Red Sox. It, was it just because they said yes? Like, I would imagine that if you are a really good team, <laughs> And you know that like this year is championship or bust. Like, let's say the Dodgers or the Yankees, for example, like both those teams were all in this year. I don't know that I would want to add the distraction of a Netflix crew following me around all year. Whereas the Red Sox were thinking we need all the positive PR attention we can get. It's only going to make it worse once it comes out is, because it's is, just. Is that the case? Did they feel that way? Like it's it's I don't yes. want to say it's tough for me to. <laughs> to look at the Red Sox as a franchise that says to themselves, we have to do some sort of like promo for what we've got going on. We have to, I don't know, like we have to church it up. We got to put lipstick on this pig. Is it They're really doing a, a section pig? 10 night, Dallas? I mean, is that more of a testament <laughs> that, of how far maybe section 10 has come as opposed no. to how far down the no, ladder? I, I think that was more of like a man, we really need to get some good faith back with the fans what 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 can we do that'll make them happy because this team is not going to make them happy in september and that's honestly right but you know what uh underdog fantasy is making everybody happy it's not just about red sox fans it's about everyone it's about baseball fans it's about sports fans and mlb season uh underdog fantasy wants to make it a lot more interesting and underdog fantasy is the easiest place to play fantasy sports Playing their pick'em game is as simple as selecting higher or lower on player stats, strikeouts, total bases, home runs, and so much more. You can make entries of all baseball, or you can mix and match across your other favorite sports. You can win up to 100 times your money, and it's a ton of fun. It's about that time, Dallas. Uh, when's week one start? Uh, what do you mean, week one? Uh, tomorrow. Tomorrow's oh, wow, really? Night. Oh, yeah. Wow, football. It's back, yeah. baby. Yeah, it so is. you can mix and match with uh, your NFL, your MLB. Whatever tickles your fancy. And the best part about it is when you sign up with the promo code Jared, J-A-R-E-D, you can get up to 
$1,000 in bonus cash and a special pick on Underdog. That's Underdog Fantasy promo code, Jared. Um, yeah, so I, to, to answer your question, Dallas, I'm not ready to put them to bed only because of how bad the oh. Royals and Twins have been also. But, I mean, the Red Sox are not... They're one game above 500 now. They're, 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 if they get swept by the Mets tonight, they're back to 500, which is fucking crazy for a, like a decent chunk of the season. They had the best record in the American League, the best record in baseball. So to be in the first week of September on the precipice of going back to 500, it's, I don't want to say it's unfathomable because it's, you know, I'm not like shocked by this, but it's just very deflating as a fan to, to kind of have that roller coaster of a season. Yeah. I mean, when you put it in perspective, it is, it's, it's kind of brutal because think about how much we've been talking about the downturn of the Seattle Mariners. And as it sits right now, you're just a half game ahead of the Seattle Mariners in the pursuit of that, that outside wild card spot, right? I mean, the Mariners are five and a half out. Yeah. Red Sox are four and a half out. And we're talking about a team in the Seattle Mariners. Tigers who, caught us. I mean, the, yeah, the Tigers, the Tigers, we're, to, we're talking, we, the Oakland A's are talking about being spoilers right now because we've got teams rolling through town who are vying for these spots. And Jared, it's funny that you talk about what isn't happening for the Red Sox right now, because that is a narrative that other people are noticing as well. There's a reason the Seattle Mariners came into town fairly excited about what they had ahead of them because they thought they were going to be rolling up on an Oakland team who was just going to roll over and ask to get their belly scratched. Well, that ain't fucking happened because they got bitch slapped twice in a row. Back-to-back nights, they got left with their dick in their hand on the field. And the Mariners looked at that series as an opportunity to close the gap. Why? Because the Red Sox are shitting the bed. And here come the Tigers. So things are getting interesting. But Everyone, I don't want to say everyone around the league because I say everyone and I mean just the folks I've talked to <laughs> with, with Seattle here at times. But even when we were in Texas, it's not like the Rangers had any, you know, delusions of grandeur thinking that they were creeping in anywhere, but they were like, Man, the Red Sox, things are not going well. I wonder what that race is going to look like. These teams that are starting to pick it up, Jay, like hey, the thought? Tigers. I, the whole conversation, you guys ended up touching on almost all the teams that I was going to bring up, but it ju- it just strikes me. That it's a real commentary on how long the baseball season is and how crazy narratives and storytelling can get as it relates to teams because you guys brought up the Red Sox and Mariners that for various reasons have definitely been teams that have been on the mention list, right, for the 2024 season. The let's talk about them, what's going right, what's going wrong as they surge forth. They are basically in the same spot as you guys mentioned with now the Detroit Tigers and the Tampa Bay Rays who have been outscored by 65 runs this year and have basically at no point been considered, I mean, maybe at points a fringe wild card team, but yeah. like never a contender. And the Tigers were put in the rearview mirror in that in that perspective a long time ago, uh, once the three other teams in the Central sort of separated themselves. And like, it just strikes me that, that, that those four teams have functionally ended up in more or less the same place, uh, you know, with... 15% of the season left to go or whatever it is. I don't know how interesting it's going to get really, because I think the, you know, the team that they're trying to catch currently is the Royals and they you know, can't play I, worse than this. No, they can't play worse than this. They're still four. They have a four and a half game cushion. And I, for my money, they are still the best team of the five teams that we are discussing, uh, so to speak, in, in this grouping. Uh, and I would say the twins are better than these teams, too. So they, they have both a lead. Uh, and in my opinion, a superior roster. So I don't know, maybe these teams will change the order that they find themselves in currently, but it would surprise me a little bit if any of these teams made a real substantive push for the wild card uh, over the final few weeks. It is getting pretty dire in the AL. The Royals well, have lost just... seven straight baseball games. Uh, the Red Sox have lost four straight. The Mariners have lost four straight. Uh, the Tigers have won seven of 10. So that's how they caught Boston. Um, but the Twins have lost uh six of ten like it's it's crazy like the american league wild card picture sucks like the royals were i thought the one team that was kind of um shit streak proof but they've proven to have the shittiest streak of them all at least recently in the last week or so but yeah it's happening at the right time though it's happening at the right time if you're the no one else is winning games simple and that and that right there like if you're ever going to 
assess a losing streak and look for a silver lining, that's the silver lining, right? That's the silver lining. I will always go back to the Dodgers and the Giants race a few years ago. What are you going to do if the other team is winning games? You got to win games. When can you lose a game? When the other team loses a game. And that's it. I know it's simple math, but when you say it out loud, it sounds even sillier. But that's the reality is if you're going to play terrible baseball based on the other teams that you're contending with, this is the best possible time you could have played the worst baseball you've played all year because everybody else is trying to figure shit out right now, too. And not to dismiss any sort of drop in postseason odds at this at this time of season, but per fan graphs, that seven game losing streak has caused them to go from 91 to 77 percent. So they are still a heavy favorite. That's not nothing, but that's, no, that's a- to your guy's point about enduring it at the right time to come out of a seven game losing streak in late August, early September, or or maybe they aren't going to come out of it, but assuming they do to have only lost 14 percent and to still be a three and four chance to make the playoffs, so to speak, I think is a pretty good. Situation. What's what's the twins percentage? Uh, the twins percentage uh, as of right now is 95 percent. So how the fuck like the twins have a one game lead over the Royals? How are they 95 and the Royals are 77? Strength of schedule remaining. Uh, so let's see the uh, rest of season uh, strength of schedule. Uh, the Royals have a noticeably harder strength of schedule per fan graphs. 510 winning percentage compared to the twins. 484. Four. I would guess 484 might be. Yeah, that's the second the easiest. easiest. Yeah, well, the, yeah, the Tigers at 480 per fan. At least what I'm looking at per fan graphs is 482. But the Twins have the second easiest schedule remaining uh, in the AL, and I would guess that they also have the Twins as a superior roster, uh, depth chart wise. So a combination of that, they have the Twins going, uh, winning fifty four percent of their games over the rest of the season, uh, where they have the Royals winning forty nine percent of their games over the remaining portion of the season. Well, that's obviously that uh, can all depressing. Very quickly, yeah. Yeah, the American League wildcard picture is very depressing. Um, but in the National League, I believe, yep. Justin Havens, you owe an apology to a uh, particular fan base. Yeah, I mean, it's really like two people who, you know, respectfully nag the shit out of me on Twitter uh, mm. pretty much every day and say, when am I <laughs> every take an day? L? I'm, I'm not kidding. Um, yeah. Take an L for the Mets. I think they threw Dallas's name in there, too, if he wanted to issue an apology after me. Um, but. Yeah, I mean, I I will take the L on the Mets. Um, I, you know, I think my exact comments were that they uh, weren't a very exciting team um, and weren't likely to be playing truly relevant baseball for much of September. I think both of those things are, um, you know, objectively untrue at this point. They are playing relevant games. They're a half game out of the wild card. Um I don't think quality wise, they're a fundamentally different team than what I said they were at the beginning of the season uh, where I but I do think that the the experience of the New York Mets in 2024 uh, to call it not exciting or not entertaining or whatever would be would be obviously misleading and and wrong at this point. They have a great thing going on over there. Well, and and, sorry, go ahead. No, the last thing I want to say was, is that I do think at some point it transitioned from being a sideshow entertainment value to real on the field baseball entertainment, because they've been involved in a lot of high stakes, high leverage games, uh, particularly of late. And we're not we're not talking about Jose Iglesias's concerts. We're not talking about Grimace. We're talking about the fact that they're a half game out of the wild card and nine, uh, 11 games over 500. Um, which I have to think is a high watermark uh, for them riding a six game win streak. So like, you know, I, I think objectively they've become more interesting for a non Mets baseball fan, but the whole narrative at this point is it has to be that this has been an entertaining ride. Yes. uh, And you can uh, see Okay. Hold on. Entertaining. Is it, is it entertaining? Let's let's. Yes. Because what jumps out at you about it? How much how much Mets baseball are you watching, Dallas? I mean, uh, enough, enough. I mean, I, I'm asking you, like, what what is what is so what is the excitement factor for you? Give for, me that. Tell one, me that. For one, uh, like this anything, is the can't miss part about it. Anytime that you have a legitimate MVP candidate on your team, and you have a guy <laughs> that first and foremost, Mets fans show up, so the environment's yes. always great at City. Second. When you have a legitimate MVP candidate on your team and you start getting to late August, early September, 
and you can chant MVP with a guy who who comes to the plate and it's actually like kind of true. Uh, that's an exciting thing. We mentioned the Jose Iglesias thing. You're like, yes, he did the concert, but like they've got the OMG thing that they hold up in the dugout. Like their players are having fun. Yep. I'm a Red Sox fan, so I watch the Red Sox every night. They don't look like they're having fun. They look like they're having an awful time. They look like I mean, they used to look like they have fun, like back when Dom Smith was there, but they DFA Dom Smith. And it feels like ever since then, they've just been pressing. They've admitted to pressing, which is why Alex Cora closed the clubhouse until 4 p.m. He's like, don't show up until four. Like none of none of that 1 p.m. bullshit. Like he saw that like guys are pressing and not having fun. He tried to change the vibe. Um, it worked for like a day or two, but it, it hasn't since. And you can see like they're not doing fun things in the dugout. Like, yeah, they do the well, they, the metal after hitting a home run, but they've been doing that all year. Like the Mets are are smiling, laughing, having a great time in the dugout. Uh, they have an MVP candidate. They've got the grimace thing. They've got the Jose Iglesias song like they, they they're just having a good and they're playing fucking awesome baseball at the most important time of the year to be playing your best baseball. That's when they're doing it. I, I, I would I would say uh, like zero pushback on the on the Lindor aspect of the excitement, but that I think is my whole perspective. That's my point. Is okay outside of that, like like for me, like and we were joking about it. Like I get it, the gimmicks behind the grimace thing, and and just you know creating a positive environment, a fun environment to come to work in and to pursue what it is you're after. I, I can appreciate that, but I think it's more about getting performances in the second half from guys you expected to get performances from that you're now getting. So I don't know that there's a, like, like for me, I guess maybe I'm processing the word excitement differently because I think there's a level of expectation that we have gotten away from with the New York Mets where because they're playing good baseball and maybe it wasn't that way early. It's like, Oh wow. What a great story. What a, well, remember this was a team that fancied themselves competitors, regardless of what, Max Scherzer had to say about what the future was looking like and what he was told. This is a team that still felt like we can. Yeah, play. but to me. Yeah, but to me, that's moving the goalposts a little bit, because to say, like, you know, expectations have changed for the New York Mets. If this is what we're accepting is exciting or entertaining baseball, that's fine. Like in the big, big picture, like, yeah, I wouldn't want this to be like the best long term version of the Mets. But like and again, you don't have to ride with what I'm saying. But like my point was, is that I, I thought. This is going to be a transition year with a minimal amount of entertainment value. And where is this thing going? And like, yes, I'm glad. I mean, obviously, Jared was and you guys were going to talk about Lindor. That to me is the overriding factor. And it like it washes away a lot of other sins, because to me, there is a huge difference between tuning in for a game featuring a top 20 player in baseball playing a typical top 20 season for that player versus a guy who is absolutely at the forefront of an MVP conversation on a team that needs every single ounce of that contribution to get into the postseason. That is what it is all about. That is dramatic. And like, if I, I mean, I, I need to name a couple of other reasons too. We're talking about a lack of young players on the team. That was something that I talked about or a lack of young players that looked like they were going to blossom and contribute. I think Francisco Alvarez was the guy that we identified. I identified as being the most interesting person by that description on the team. Mark Vientos at this point has to be mentioned. He's hitting 281, 337, 544. He's got 22 homers and 359 plate appearances. I don't think he's been brought up one time on this podcast this season, and that's fine. But like, that's a 24-year-old who's playing really, really good, particularly offensive baseball, and, and, and is not a total liability defensively either. I think that has to be considered really encouraging. And while I'm not still particularly, you know, bookmarking a Sean Manaya or a Luis Severino start like Sean Manaya yeah. has been unquestionably a lot better than I anticipated he would be. He's got a three, three, five and 27 starts at this point. So it's just a really good season at this point. There's no qualifier needed. And Luis Severino has been perfectly fine. He's definitely earned back what they signed him for, uh, giving him 27 starts and 160 innings like that has to be considered a win for them. So like, yeah, I just think and David Peterson and et cetera, he had another nice start last night, which I got a nug on for later, but like, well, yeah, those two I, dudes, I, it's wrong, those man. Two dudes, and like, those, those are yeah. the guys that I was talking about the, like the second half performances right there. Well, I mean, P Peterson, 
you, you look at his numbers, and I won't throw any numbers out there if you're gonna if you're gonna go on and dive with him later. No, it's just go um, ahead, go ahead. It's not deep. It's just yeah. Go ahead. Well, no, just the uh, yeah, um, what his last seven starts, the sub two ERA. Uh, you know, overall record win loss, you can do with that what you will. But the fact that they're winning the baseball games that he's participating in, the games that he's starting, um, he did join a club, punched out eleven on his birthday, which is pretty cool. One of twenty four people to ever punch out double digit guys on his birthday. Um, but I think those are a couple guys right there, like Manaya. Mets in the second half, twenty six and eighteen. Fourth in baseball, 140 extra base hits. That's good for seventh. They've hit 22 go-ahead homers. That's second behind the Dodgers, who've hit 23. The 3.59 ERA is fifth. The starters ERA at 3.72 is fifth. The 246 and two-thirds innings from their starters is second to Kansas City. And the pin ERA is 3.35. I think you're, I think you're, work. I think you're kind of arguing against yourself almost at this point, buddy. I think you're no, my, uh, my, no the the excitement fact, like because for me watching Sean Mania have a good second half, it's not like that. There's been like you know like the big fourteen punch out performance. Like I I have no problem admitting that I was <clears throat> like uh, defining excitement differently because I, I think to the point of having somebody that is garnering the attention that Lindor is. That's exciting. You have an MVP candidate. Yep. You think they get in, Jay? Hey? I mean, I'm rooting for him at this point. I don't. Uh, I don't like the idea that I that's taken hold that I somehow root against the Mets. I mean, since no. I moved to the East Coast, I watch probably more Mets games uh, than any NL team. But great boots, uh, I call it the best. Yeah, and it's great to have that booth in the mix too, in in relevant high stakes games too. Because as you said, uh, an elite elite booth. Um, generally speaking, I, I I am rooting for the Mets as it relates to them versus the Braves for a couple of reasons. Uh, a uh, Mets, as you said, very important. That fan base shows up, and they show up uh, in the stadium, and I think that would be an electric atmosphere uh, for. Uh, to watch on TV or maybe for even the baseball is dead crew to visit for a yeah. uh, for a postseason stunt mm-hmm. uh, dirt at some point that I think they've got the positive momentum and be like this. This Braves team just feels like it's uh, well, it, it is obviously an incomplete version of this era of a Braves team. And I would rather in in my opinion, I would rather see an upstart um team that's kind of riding the wave like the Mets get in as a wild card team if we're letting six teams in every every year then you know kind of like a 75 percent version of of a Braves team that will probably be very good again next season Dallas do they get in uh I think they do because I think that the pursuit of Atlanta right now um I think that's going to happen I don't think that the Braves are going to be able to fend off if I'm, and straight up, just back to the two, two guys that I'm talking about, if Manaya and Peterson can continue to throw the ball the way that they are in Severino, like that, yeah. Yep, I like their chances. Pitching well at the right time. Yeah. Helps when you run up against the Red Sox and you have a lefty. I mean, it, like, is there any concern about, like, I, I know we've talked about some of the guys offensively. You brought up Vientos. Um, we've highlighted the Lindor. MVP campaign. McNeil has swung the bat well during the second half. Is there? Uh, what about a pickup any- by like Jesse Winker pickup? Winker, been fucking awesome. Yeah, oh, he's been like, great. He's hitting over three hundred the second half. Like he's, he's got like almost like a four hundred on base. Yeah, he's he's doing well. So like yeah. as far as the are we okay with what that is? Is that enough offense? Um. Ah. Uh- I think I think what they really need is Pete Alonso to be Pete Alonso. Like they need, I I think it's great what Lindor is doing, a resurgence year, an MVP caliber season. But at the end of the day, the star of the New York Mets is Pete Alonso. And I, has it been a Pete Alonso type season? No. Um, is it a wash? No. Like he's, it's. I think that if if he and he homered last night. If this is a guy that gets hot in September into October, he's the type of guy that can make a huge difference for them, whether it's, you know, hey, we accomplished our goal. I know that no, everyone wrote us off. No one believed in us. Also, another guy uh, that's on paternity leave right now, but J.D. Martinez has been there and done that offensively uh, in the postseason. 
So but does it you concern have, you if go ahead, go ahead. Uh, the the trio of Lindor, JD, and Alonzo that uh, on top of their game is that enough to get the Mets uh, a, a nice little run in October if the pitching lines up? Yes, yeah, I think so. Yes. Well, that that that's the question is because right now it's JD and Pedro's performance sort of on paper, right? You got to get JD back into the mix, and then. My question is, is Pete Alonzo contributing the way he is right now? Should it not get any better, but not get any worse? Is that enough during a postseason run for Lindor and the weight that he's carrying to get the Mets over the hump? I, um, are we totally recalibrating the expectations? Because the answer no, no, is not yes. No, not at all. Not at all. Okay, so the answer is yes to, for me if the question is, is this a good enough offense for them to get to the postseason? Yes. They, no, 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 no. Are, I think for me, I think it was more so like, is this a, like once you get there? No, to make this, a push. Yes. Yeah. Is this lineup enough to be a threat to someone that's, you know, kind of I, been in the playoff picture all year? Because I we think need they 11 could wins, absolutely. Right? I, I mean, they could win a playoff series uh, with this offense. I don't think they're making a like a run to the world series with this team. I don't think that's necessarily an offensive problem, though. Um, to me, I would still go back to the likelihood of a rotation fronted by Sean Manaya and Luis Severino and David Peterson guiding you to a World Series. That doesn't feel like something that's likely to happen. I feel like this offense, they're scoring at the same rate in terms of runs per game as the Royals, the Red Sox, the Padres. Like th th This is a good enough offense. Um, I just don't think it's, I don't think the team as a whole is a run to the World Series type of team. But maybe I'll have to apologize for that too in a, in a, in a, couple, in a month and a half. Mm. Either way, that would be cool it'll, if I had to do that, by the way. It will be a fun run. Yeah. Uh, half game out, the Mets. Half game out, heading into play tonight against the Boston Red Sox, who uh, uh, have completely mailed it in. Well, you know, good run there for a while. Um, if anybody's looking for a pick-me-up, though, Red Sox or Mets or otherwise, make sure to sign up with the code Jared to get up, a th up to $1,000. In mm -hmm. bonus cash and a special pick on underdog. That's underdog promo code Jared. That's right. That's right. Thank you. Um, last night, Clay Holmes, walk off Grand Slam, Wyatt Langford. Oh, the it fucking is the, Rangers. Fuck. It is the 11th blown save of the season for clay holmes all-star clay holmes um did some digging today or this morning since june 13th amongst the 134 relief pitchers with at least 25 appearances again this is since june 13th clay holmes ranks a 125th in era it's a 561 uh, 114th in whip it's a 144 and has the most blown saves eight Eight. So I remember, and, and shout out to um, our guy Hubs for reminding me. But when Aroldis Chapman was struggling, I mean Joe Girardi uh, yanked him from the closer's role uh, after like three blown saves. Clay Holmes has been blowing saves at a rapid pace, an alarming pace over the last three months. And Aaron Boone is like, that's my guy. That's him. Well, not Isn't now. Isn't he beautiful? Not now, Jared. Well, he keeps saying he keeps citing bad luck for these. No, no. Well, that that's that's where things have started to change. Because when asked this time, his response was, I'm not going to answer that right now when we're raw and emotional. We'll talk through it and do what we think is the best thing. That was his I response got the audio right this here. time. Got the audio right here. Aaron clearly, clearly lacked command there in the ninth inning. Just what were you seeing from him mechanically as to why he had so much trouble? Yeah, just, um, you know, obviously couldn't finish a couple guys off. Had 3-2 with, with Smith there and lost him. Um, and then losing losing uh, Simeon and then, you know, a hanger there. So, um, you know, obviously a tough night and, and um, you know. We gotta get over it. 
You now fall out of first place in the AL East, the 11th blown save for Holmes this season. Do you need to go another direction when it comes to the closer? Well, I'm not going to answer that right now. We're raw and emotional, and you know we'll talk through and, and do what we think is uh, the best thing. Aaron, when he walks the first guy and it starts unraveling a, a little bit for him, do you do you see, does it feel like he's losing confidence as time goes on out there? No, I, you know, there's been times like that in past years where I feel like he's gone through a weak stretch where he's kind of struggled mechanically. I, I don't feel he's had a lot of those stretches this year. Um, you know, tonight they, they, you know, they, they got him. You know, you know, a lot of the times where, you know, we, we've lost out there, it's been, you know, soft contacts beating them. You know, obviously that wasn't the case tonight. Walked two guys and, and obviously Lankford put a real charge into one. So, um, you know, we gotta, we gotta, you know, make sure he's good and, and, uh, and, and make sure he's, he's good, you know, uh, I think he handles all this very well, um, and he's tough-minded for it. Um, you know, but but obviously, you know, some tough ones here of late, and you know, we got to support him and and make sure he's um, right and a big part of what we're doing back there. So, if you're the Yankees and you're Aaron Boone, because obviously it's not entirely Aaron Boone's decision to remove your All-Star closer as closer. I don't think that, especially in today's game, Dallas. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, that's not just the manager's decision. That's the decision of multiple individuals. But I think where you run into problems now, if you're the Yankees, is it's September 4th. There, like This should have been something that the Yankees addressed at the trade deadline, because at that point, you had had, what, a month and a half of home struggling? I'm not saying you go out there and trade for a closer, but there were some top relievers out there that you could have gone out and acquired or attempted to acquire because I go back to the same point. You have one year of Juan Soto. Like this was the year to, to really go for it. If you're the New York Yankees, you are not promised Juan Soto beyond this year. You have a lineup of Aaron Judge and Juan Soto, the number one and what, number three players in baseball and wins above replacement on the same team in the same lineup. And... You have a closer who, yes, was an all-star, but was sputtering leading up to the trade deadline. You did nothing to address that. It didn't work itself out. It seems to be getting worse. And your internal options, sure, they're an improvement, but are they closers? Like Tommy Canley? Is that is that who you throwing out there in the ninth day? Like, what are what are you gonna do? Like, if if Clay Holmes continues to blow games like this, the Yankees have now lost. Five games when leading after eight innings. That I mean, that's the division right there. That's he's blown. He's blown eleven out of the forty chances. He's blown eleven games, but the Yankees have lost five games when leading after eight innings. So, what do you do? I mean, is this something where you kind of have to blame Brian Cashman a little bit? You have to blame Aaron Boone for keep putting him out there. And you look at the roster construction and say, well, I mean, what else are we supposed to do? Who else is who else is getting well, those innings? Well, you can't uh, you can't acknowledge that Aaron Boone isn't making the decision and then in the same breath blame him for running. No, he's that one guy. of the people. No, he's one of the people. He doesn't have to call for him. Well, no, but then if he didn't, Jared, there would be a meeting right after the game. And right. it would go like this. What are you doing? You don't make that decision on your own. That's for us collectively to make. So we can't, we can't privatize the gain and socialize the loss. Like he is either a part of the problem at the beginning or he's a part of the problem or he's not a part of the problem. So like, I like, I'm not defending Aaron Boone here, but we can't say that he has his hands tied when it comes to pointing out who his stopper is going to be. And then also blame him for running out the guy who, he doesn't have full and total autonomy over. So to your point about what are they going to do? Well, I've watched a bullpen unfold in a fashion where if you've got other guys down there that you feel you can use in leverage spots, it's just a matter of opportunity and a little dash of confidence before they start to fancy themselves a ninth inning guy, someone who can get those big outs. So if you're in a big league bullpen and you feel like you've only got one individual down there, mentally capable of handling what comes with the ninth inning, that right there is more of an indictment on where things are at because Aaron Bood twice very carefully tiptoed around 
the impact that this is having mentally on Clay Holmes. And then he even went back and sort of assured you without saying what he said, telling you that he feels Clay Holmes is able to handle this stuff right now. He feels he's someone who can handle this. Okay, that's fine. I'm sure you have a better read on him than 99% of the other people out here. But if you're at a spot where you, you're looking down there and you don't have an answer as to who else could step in, like why is Tommy Kingley not a guy that you don't have the confidence or that you have the confidence in? Why is he I mean, somebody that you have not talked about this with? Maybe they have. he's not a strikeout guy. I mean, I guess like that's what you're looking for here. But, um, you know, you look at some of the really like Tommy Canley since July 1st has a 152 ERA. It's a 110 whip. So he's limiting the traffic, but it's an 8.37 strikeouts per nine. So it's like you're not you're not getting the the punch outs, which is what you'd hope for in a closer. But is that entirely necessary when you're trotting out a guy that's not that's, walking a ton of guys and he's this is where it damage? comes this. This is where putting a bullpen together is so important because you have to be able to look at those last six, eight outs, maybe even the last nine outs, and figure out how you're going to put those together. How do we get these, right? We're, we're not giving them to one guy. You get the seventh, you get the eighth, you get the ninth. Traditionally, that's how it's worked. But if you don't have a closer and you can't work backwards from the ninth inning, then it is legitimately about... Who can match up in this spot right here, right now? The idea of swing and miss at the back end of a bullpen is not new. It's not foreign. It limits the opportunity for the game to shift with one swing, right? So it's it's understood that you're looking for the swing and miss. But if you are a team that doesn't generate that and you don't have any help coming, buddy, <laughs> you got to figure it out. Like if all you have is the slingshot, you got to figure out how to pull it back as far as you can. You got to figure out how to put the best stone in that slingshot for yourself. You can't just put the slingshot down and start throwing the fucking rocks. You got to do something. My vote is for Jake Cousins. Jake Cousins for Yankees closer. Jake Cousins, since July 1st, has appeared in 27 games for the New York Yankees. He's got a 293 ERA, which fine. It's... He's a reliever. Maybe it's one blow up outing in there that kind of skews that. It's an 098 whip. He's the only Yankee reliever with at least 20 appearances, or excuse me, at least 15 appearances um, since July 1st with a sub one whip. And the strikeouts per nine leads the Yankee bullpen 12.36. So he's punching dudes out. What's the, uh, what's the K to walk? Uh, it is 345. So 38 strikeouts, 11 walks. He's a little bit susceptible to the long ball, four homers there. But I mean, he's, he's punching guys out more. He's punching guys out better than anyone in the Yankees bullpen. And he's limiting traffic better than anyone in the Yankees bullpen. That's what I look for. What's the long ball rate compared to the other options? Not that it's going to be a, a huge deciding factor, but what, what is that number? Uh, it is uh, 130 home runs per nine. So you're looking at Canley, 076, Hill, 031, Weaver, 165, Holmes, 086. So yeah, it's, it's so, so that's you might give it up. And that right there, <laughs> that's enough to scare guys, to scare the front office out of a leverage spot. Like, ah, he's just, he's going to leave one middle, man. Like he's going to leave one middle. We can't, we don't want to let that happen. And it's not to say that he'll never have that opportunity, never get that shot, but that is a real concern. We just, we all, we can all agree that you're hunting the swing and miss in that spot. So if you have somebody that is susceptible to getting popped like that, it's not a clear cut, easy, yes, this is the guy decision that comes with a little hesitation for that reason right there. We just talked about Clay Holmes giving up the game with a lead five separate times. I don't know how many of those came via the long ball, but my guess is more than one. And now you're going to run a guy out there who has a significantly greater potentiality for the homer as opposed to the dude who, even in the face of a massive struggle, is still not as susceptible to the homer. I just uh, I just texted Hubs. I said, why is Jake Cousins not your closer? And he said, Bone. 
And I said, is that the popular opinion that he should be the guy? He's responding right now. I'll let you know what he says. Well, I think drama. based on the remaining options, yeah, because Canley just throws a change up and Luke Weaver just can't be the guy. So sounds like Yankee fans want Jake Cousins. Wow. Uh, three little items here. Uh, observations, I guess. Uh, that home run that Clay Holmes, the granny that Clay Holmes uh, allowed off of his slider to Wyatt Langford was the first homer he's allowed off of his slider in over a year. Uh, August 28th, 2023 was the last time that somebody got him with that pitch. Um, and he is the first Yankees reliever with 11 or more blown saves in a season since Dave Rigetti in mm. 1987. Um, so it's been a long time since a Yankees closer has had this number of high profile meltdowns. Uh, and final observation, uh, I am tickled with excitement, uh, at the idea that at least as long as he is the closer, uh, the two primary AL East threats and two teams with World Series aspirations have just uh, as volatile of closers as you could possibly have uh, in those spots between Holmes and Craig Kimbrell uh, and the the angst level uh, for those oh. fan bases uh, in high profile spots is going to be through the roof as long as those two are pitching. So that's Nothing as a neutral observer. Over. Yeah, as a neutral observer um, with uh with just drama at stake, I think that's uh, potentially pretty fun. Um, <laughs> the White Sox are still the White Sox, apparently. And it's great it's, size, uh, more, just wearing it. We're starting to we're starting to jeopardize the health and safety of others involved. <laughs> right, really, of of everybody involved. Uh, this is where this is getting. Like, like we all saw the collision out in left field. Let's see. Hold on. Yeah, and the truth is, if you have great stuff, you can challenge over the white part of the plate a little bit more and let your stuff just play. If you don't, you better figure out. Oh, no. Oh, my goodness. The White Sox have just gone full White Sox. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. There's a ball hit down the left field line. Three, three fielders converge. No one makes the play. Two men are down. It's uh, I mean, one who was the player that was just writhing in agony? Like he got fucking squared up, like he ate that shoulder, fucking ate it, because um, he hit the, he hit the ground and was like, there was no concern for the baseball. It was I, I might be looking for teeth. Yeah, that's that's pretty bad when you Google who is number twenty on the White Sox and Google's like, I don't know, dude. <laughs> Uh, that was Miguel Vargas, who has been the saddest player the entire year. Every time they show him, he's super sad. And now he's, he's gotta be super sad now. Damn. Yeah. How about, how about the interaction, uh, at home plate with Grady Sizemore? He was getting into it. We don't see, we don't see managers get that animated anymore. Well, the manager... I mean, whoever that home plate umpire was, he was giving it way back to him, too. He didn't back down at all. It was Wendelstadt, wasn't it? Oh, uh, yeah. Yes. They were yeah. going nose to nose there. Oh, when Wendelstadt, like, said, have you dropped an F-bomb on him? Like, fuck you. <laughs> like, just a... Like, yeah. I, I, was, I was a little taken aback by that, to be totally honest. Like, that it was that blatant and that there wasn't like any sort of like follow-up to it like oh grady come on fuck you man he was blah 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 like it wasn't that it was no this is fuck and you and it's all meant for you yeah he like yeah that. you can hear a very distinct fuck you <laughs> to yeah, grady like, there, more. there's no <laughs> like i i found that i found that to be a little harsh hunter i found that to be a little harsh I mean, I'm sure that happens all the damn time. I, I mean, let's get real, though. It's I know we're sort of just like assuming, but like the call that prompted oh my Grady God. Sizemore to go out was fucking atrocious. And that's that's Jay. Hey, what? I know I get blasted for the take, but that's right there. Why I want 
the 40 man roster. That's why I don't want the game with a clock. That's why all of those old head yelling at the cloud sort of takes are for this reason right here. Because if you've ever played a baseball game where you've been down an unsurmountable amount of runs and then come back and have won the game that you were never supposed to win, insurmountable. you know that it's because something happened that just nobody saw coming, wasn't supposed to happen. You put something together and it well, starts with something going your way. And if you don't get that strike called on you, maybe Benintendi is able to get the inning going. Maybe sure. that sparks blah, 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 right? And you're going to have a really tough time telling 26 alphas that their chance is gone when they still have totally. a chance. When the board still says, I have a chance. You're going to sit there and tell me that I don't have a chance? No, what the fuck? Who who were no. you to tell me? I I completely, like... I, I put it in here so that we could have some fun at the White Sox expense because like everybody is having fun at the White Sox expense for that play. But like yes. as it relates to what you're saying about like if I'm Ben Attendee or I'm Grady Sizemore, I want the same level of respect from the umpire as it relates to the strike zone as every other player or every other team or manager that is participating. And like it's not like Hunter Wendelstadt is like some rookie umpire. He's been around a long time. I don't know exactly his, how long, but like his the, dad, dude, there's lineage, Jay. Hey, those calls were unacceptable. And it wasn't just that high slider or curveball or whatever it was, which is weird that he would call that a strike anyway, given most umpires uh, preference to not call the breaking ball high anyway. But like the, the next pitch was six inches off the plate outside that he run or whatever the subsequent uh, the at bat ender uh, for Ben attendee that caused him to get ejected from the game. And it's like, dude, you're not even trying at this point. You're being, you're being openly spiteful. And frankly, like, yeah, I know umpires have to deal with a lot of abuse. If you blow a call that badly, like he did to prompt Grady Sizemore to come out of the thing. I don't want to hear you well, say, fuck you back to the, ump well, back to the manager. Fuck uh, you. Uh, like, exactly. What are you talking about? Like, well, Jay, you the, fucked the, up. The, the, the point is, and this is where they come from. They're doing something that in our game, as players, you understand that this happens. And this happens in Little League, dude. It happens in Little League, all right? You watch it with the volunteer umpires. You get kids that are just better than other kids. And that group of kids is kicking the shit out of this other group. So what happens? The umpire tells you, hey, strike zone's going to get a little bigger, all right? We're going to get it moving. Be and why? Because this fucking thing is over. We can all see it's over. And we're just going through the motions now. The whole point is this is the big leagues. And this is not the level for that to happen. Does it still happen? You bet your ass it does. And do we know that as players? Yes, we do. Does it sit well with us? No, it doesn't. Do we understand it to an extent? Yes, we do. You want to know when it's a little more digestible and tolerable? April, May, maybe even June. But here it is, September. We are the worst team baseball has seen arguably in its existence. And this is the kind of shit that's happening to us right now. Like it is fuel on the fire. And just back to the competitive streak. It, there is no league bigger than this. There's, there's no bigger leagues. This is the big leagues. And so we're all in this together. We're all competing on the same level. Some of us don't belong on the same field as the other guys, but we're here. And you don't get to just tell me that I'm going to take a back seat right now. Because you want to get on the fucking plane and get out of here. Fuck you. No, no. Fuck you. Fuck me. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was a great exchange. I, I respect the, the hunter just going, you know what? Fuck you. <laughs> yeah. It's I mean, it's September. We're all in yeah, for everybody. Mindset. For yeah. everybody. It's not just the players. <laughs> the fans are pissed. The executives are pissed. Everybody's pissed. Um. I know I'm not pissed, though, because Underdog just revealed the uh, promo calendar for week one, Jay Hay. Oh, boy. Mm -hmm. That is some hot stuff. I mean, it is chock full. I'm seeing two free picks here. Well, and do you hear about the news today? What's the news today? Dropping three additional discounts. Oh. Unscheduled off the promo calendar. Okay. Oh, I love off the menu. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, 
I mean, you're you can see it if you're on social media. You can see it if you open your underdog app, uh, and you can hear about it if you're listening to this podcast. But above and beyond the promo schedule that Jared's referring to uh, today, you will find three unannounced discounts for every user. Underdog always doing it big, especially for week one. I mean, you have to go big for week one, especially now that we yeah. have Bill Belichick in the mix. That's crazy that we're all kind of in this together. Mm-hmm. It was just us and Bill against the world. It, f- it feels like it's been that way for quite some time, but even more so now. How many is that? That's between Jake, me, you, and Dallas. That's six Super Bowl championships six, is yep. head, uh, head NFL football mm-hmm. coach. Mm-hmm. Yep. Doesn't even doesn't even obviously count the work that he did as the uh, Giants defensive coordinator, right? I believe he got a ring or two there as well. Yeah, under uh, the tuna, as they like to call him, Bill yeah. Parcells. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a lot of Patriots Unannounced. lineage. Yeah, very exciting times. Very exciting times. Uh, last night, Ben Joyce threw the fastest pitch ever recorded in Major League Baseball history. Well, first I mean, it's for, for a strikeout. I, so I think when people say, oh, it's the only one on record, it's like, I'm pretty sure we can safely say that no one. Yeah. Yeah. Before this was throwing 106, 105.5. <laughs> excuse me. Like, I don't think. I don't know. Can you? Can you? Uh, yeah. I feel yeah. good what? about it. Yeah. How, I feel how, how do you feel so confident about it? Uh, because the league average fastball back then was fucking 65 miles an hour. That's well, that's not true. It is, but it is. I mean, if the league average fastball in the nineties was like 88, me, then what do we, let me say about? this. Let me, let me throw some Nolan Ryan slander out there. If this Please. is really the path. Whoa, you want to go hey, down. fucking no, 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 choose your mm-hmm. next hold words. On. Very wisely. Oh, speak, on. I've thought about your ass speak on it. Into Jay. a pit. If, if let's, let's operate under the premise that this isn't the fastest that any people have ever thrown ever, and that there were indeed people, namely Nolan Ryan is one who's brought up, who was throwing 106 miles an hour mm-hmm. back in the 70s and 80s, let's mm-hmm. say, okay? If he was throwing 106 miles an hour in 1974 or 1982 and was only as good as he was, which is zero Cy Young Awards uh, mm-hmm. for those uh, counting at home, oh, that fuck, is actually even more of an indictment of Nolan Ryan than anything I've heard to this point. So he was, think about how fast 106 is now. He was that, we know that they weren't on the whole throwing as fast back then, even if we want to say that there were outliers throwing 106. The league mm-hmm. wasn't throwing as hard as they do now. So Nolan Ryan was throwing something like 16 miles an hour or 14 miles an hour faster on his fastball than the league average, and he was still trotting out there with those 375 ERAs. Jeez. Well, it's not. It's not, we're not saying time. he was throwing one hundred and four every pitch. No one's saying that. No, Ben fucking Ben Joyce basically is at this point. He's he is it. it every fucking time I look up, it's it's a one hundred and two. One hundred and two is the entry point. Like like Ben Joyce is the other room in the casino that nobody's allowed in. Like they just have a dealer there standing in front of a table with like diamond encrusted cards and they're like you could play here but nobody can afford to this is the highest roller room like you start at 102 and that's the heater it's can i it, can i put on my player can i put on my player hater cap for a please, second please you take it, it off it doesn't <laughs> good job uh i it doesn't do a whole lot for me I always sort of wondered what the high, you know, what 105 would look like or 106 would look like or whatever. And like, I think I'm realizing that it really is all about context and that I need to, if I see this to like oh, yeah. lock up a postseason spot or lock up the NLCS and Ben Joyce or whoever reaches back and gives me 105 or 106 and strikes the last guy out and is like, yeah, we're going to the World Series or we're going to the postseason or whatever. I will be fucking through the roof watching that shit happen. But in like a but in like a, a early September, mid August game for no fault to Ben Joyce, these games in the national scheme of things don't really matter. The I, I do feel like it's a little bit of a that's, Jay, it. Uh, that's so, it. So so listen, I'm 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 so glad that you 
brought that up and it was said in this way and that you said what you just said before it about it not doing much for you and the context and everything. And, and I truly feel this way about stuff like this. Uh, and it has nothing to do with, oh, you didn't play, so you don't know. I've had guys come up to me uh, and talk to me about their at-bats against Mason Miller, facing Mason Miller, because I've got a little project we're working on. And they have mentioned specifically the focus of the at-bat feeling like a postseason experience because you got to lock the fuck in. If you are not locked in, the at-bat is over. You don't have a chance. If you're not taking this at-bat like you would take an at-bat in October, you don't stand much of a chance. If you're just willing to give away a slider, or get, that could be your life. It's fucking done. Absolutely over. So the excitement that I think comes with that, there's a, there's a level of that. And like our radio guys, they have to go down and get an interview right after the game. So sometimes they're not able to watch that, that half inning. And for the longest time, uh, one of our guys was not able to get down and watch Mason Miller perform live. Everything he had seen was just sort of on the TV. Well, he was down live and he came up and said, bro, that that's a fucking experience. That's an experience to hear and feel the fans. And so the point that I'm getting at is like, I, I would want you, Jay Hay, to hell with seeing it like in that stage setting. Like I want you down behind the dish or just off to the side, just watching that for an inning and, and fucking feeling. And that may because, indeed, yeah, it may indeed be an, a completely different experience. To well, see it's it just, live. it's a, yeah. it's a force, man. Like when you're not used to seeing shit move that way and you're not used to seeing swings from guys, like you can just see guys go, all right, this is different. We're playing on expert mode. I got to fucking spread out. This is a completely different vibe. It's just, uh, so I, I, I get it though. What you're saying like, ah, oh, well, how exciting is it? You know, it's 105. Okay, I've seen hard pitches get thrown by guys. But uh, just the, the weight of the dominance, and I, and I think you're right, I agree. If we're bringing home a ring and it's punctuated with 107 by a guy, fuck yeah. I got the pitch that Papelbon hit me with was faster than any pitch Babe Ruth ever saw in his entire career. It's true. Shut up. That's true. Do we know how fast that's, that pitch was? 90. That's true. He still, he still got 90 in there in that arm? Yeah. It's pretty impressive. He said uh, he, he did say, like, if I were to continue pitching right now the way that Rich Hill just came back, he's like, I would need Tommy John surgery before I return to baseball. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. Mm. You know what else makes sense? What? Making sure you sign up with the code Jared. Yeah. Get up to $1,000 in bonus cash yes. and a special pick on underdog. That's mm -hmm. underdog. Promo code J-A-R-E-D. Jared. Jared. That's right. Uh, earlier in the program, Justin Havens cited that Phil, uh, excuse me, City Field would be a great place to go for the postseason. We already know that a great place to go in the postseason is going to be Philadelphia. Uh, and it's because of a guy like Kyle Schwarber who hit three home runs last night. Three. Count them up. And, you know, we've we've kind of highlighted Kyle Schwarber a little bit before this year about how he's not having your um, at least recently prototypical Kyle Schwarber type season uh, hitting for a little bit more of a average. You know, the power is going to be there. You know, the walks are going to be there. He actually leads the league in walks this year with 94. But he's hitting 245, which would uh, be his highest mark since 2021 when he hit 266. The on base is 369 this year, which is a, mm, about 25 points higher than his career high. Um, and he's slugging 474 for a nice little 843 OPS. Ho hum, another 30 home run season for Kyle Schwarber last night. Uh, got him to 31 on the year. So, yeah, nice little, uh, nice little contract that ended up being, Jake. You know, imagine if the Red Sox had a guy like that. Fuck. No, that's you fine. got Tristan Casas. You're fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like Tristan Casas. Could have both of them. Yeah, you definitely could have both. Nothing preventing you from having both. I would agree with that statement. Kyle Schwarber, 
Second player in Philly's franchise history to have a five hit game with at least three of those hits being homers. So this just this wasn't just I'm going to get up there and I'm going to sock three homers. Mm -hmm. This was I'm going to put together a five hit game. And three of them are going to be homers. Uh, the only other person who's ever done that in Philly's franchise history is Mike Schmidt in 1976. Mm. Yeah. Michael yeah, Jack. Jack. Only the greatest third baseman of all time. No big deal. Michael Jack. Well, this rundown feels intentional now, Jake, because the next topic is Chris Sale secures his eighth 200 strikeout season. This feels intentional. Um, I promise it wasn't, man. I mm, just go. Oh. I just go for the stories. Yeah. You yeah. Know? Yep. yeah. Big story. Kyle Schwarber, three home run game last night. And um, Chris Sale struck out his 200th batter um, for the Braves. That's awesome. I just, yeah, I know you don't want to dwell on it, so I'll just no. drop a nug and we can move on. We've done the whole Chris Sale thing. I know you're happy for him. I am. Uh, you don't, yeah, you don't need to, you don't need to uh, sell it. I believe you uh, for what it's worth. Eighth 200 <laughs> strikeout season. Uh, that is tied with Steve Carlton for the second most 200 strikeout seasons ever by a left-handed pitcher. Ever. Eight 200 strikeout seasons. Uh, the only person that they are behind, and they are behind quite a bit. I would give Chris Sale a better chance to catch him than Steve Carlton, uh, but Randy Johnson has 13, 13. Such seasons. Go get him. Go get him, Chris. Only need just five need a more 200 more. strikeout seasons. Uh, good luck to you. That is dominance. I mean, with, front with runner. each and every start, it's this. It's just that much closer to the Cy Young. That's really yep. what's going on here. Front runner. Sorry about it. Front runner. I mean, could you imagine a Red Sox team right now with a perennial All Star like Mookie Betts to build around a guy mm -hmm. like Kyle Schwarber dropping bombs the way he oh, is, don't and do a guy, no, come on, a guy ready to come win on, the fucking man. Cy Young at mm -hmm. this stage in his career? There's no way three players of that ilk could help a team like the dude, Red Sox right now. Mm -hmm. Dude, it's not it's it's not town now. Okay? Um, it's about not town. Uh, one final thing on Chris Sale, 2.03 ERA. Uh, and FIP actually says he's been unlucky because he has a 1.63 FIP over this stretch with oh. 93 innings pitched and only 75 hits allowed with 124 strikeouts over his last 15 starts. He has not allowed more than two earned runs in any of those 15 starts. The Oakland A's suck, by the That's way. That's basically since the A's start. No. That, I mean, it is no. since the A's start when they got him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The A's. The A's best team in baseball in the second half, bud. Yeah. But it's a, it's a whole season type That's game. all right. Yeah, That's all right. We like, to, we like to split our seasons up in, in parts, Jared. Mm -hmm. We like. Uh, I'm just. I'm that's, just. I'm you know that thinking, that's how baseball is looked at, Jared. It's looked yeah, at in, but, in parts, right? I mean, you were talking big dates. picture. With the Red Sox, I'm just saying, big picture, they suck. No, big. No, I was talking about big picture. Wouldn't yeah. you love to have these yeah. things that you have talked like about? You're missing the whole and that would, season. That would be know, no. The whole season for like the A's, dating not back like, like a few years. Contextually, nope. As no like a suck. whole, if no, suck. if it wasn't for that A's start, Sale would have a real shot at a sub two this year. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they had told a good you so game. You did tell us. I think that, that might have been the last time you were right on this podcast. That's crazy. Yeah. Told you. Yeah. Team Oof, sucks. Well, a long time ago. <laughs> mm -hmm. That was June right 1st. A lot. Yeah. Damn. So you took all of July and August off that, and really most of June, I guess. That's crazy. Right. I don't even no, I remember know July I and August when I was telling you about what Lawrence well Butler and Brent Rooker were doing. Yep. Start practicing by removing the Oakland part. I'm just calling them the A's. Well, they are. I don't, don't want to check the schedule. I don't want to slip up in the future. Check the schedule. Call them Oakland. You know, that would be a mischaracterization of the uh, the team's location. The team that's located in Oakland right now. Right now, yeah, yep. yeah. Game Time has a new feature called Game Time Picks that makes getting tickets to your favorite live events even easier. Game Time Picks filters out the fluff to show you only incredible deals on great seats so you don't have to waste time searching through thousands of tickets. Uh, I know that like the whole thing with Game Time is you're supposed to wait or you could wait, get the best deals right up until first pitch. Um, but I'm kind of like starting to itch about playoff tickets. 
Like I want to make sure that if there's going to be um, a rowdy host city that we're there. I know we're going to be doing streams and whatnot for the wild card round, but once that division series hits, I mm-hmm. want to be in the house, Jay. Hey, I want to be in Hell the yeah, house. Hell yeah, man. Yeah. Well, we got a got a lot of good ones potentially with yep. not not that far away. Right. Um, the New here. Yorks, mm-hmm. Philly, Baltimore. Mm-hmm. Baltimore would be great. <laughs> I would, I would, I would lean towards. I know you, you want to experience. I mean, I, I'd be happy with any of the three, to be honest with you. But Baltimore, oh, would yeah. be cool too, because I've done Philly. Not that I wouldn't want to do it again. Oh, I, I've never been to Camden Yards, so that's oh that that would be a huge uh, check off my list in terms of getting all all the ballparks done because that's it's beautiful. That's yeah, that's an unacceptable one to still have on the docket. And I've been to Philly for a playoff game, so while I would love to be back. Uh, especially in this new era, this the Bryce Harper era. Um, I have technically experienced that before. So we I think all of those would be great, though. Well, no matter what, we're going to be using game time to get those tickets. Uh, the game time picks curation makes it easier to save more on sports, concerts, comedy, theater, uh, all in pricing. You toggle that feature and it'll show you the total up front with no surprise fees at checkout. Get a panoramic view from your seat in the app before you buy. The lowest price guarantee or game time will credit you 110% of the difference. Your purchase is covered with the most flexible customer service policy in the ticketing industry today. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. Download the game time app, create an account. Use the promo code BID for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account. Use the promo code BID for $20 off. Download the game time app today. Dallas, what time is it? Game time. It's game time. Uh, I got a question. For the panel? For you? For me. For Jake? For the panel. Is there, um, is there any concern about the maturity level and the lack of leadership that oh, could be boy. existent or non-existent in that Red Sox clubhouse? No. No? Nope. You call Rafi Devers is the, w- would you would you consider Devers the leader? No. Is there a leader? Yeah, Rob Ref Snyder and Jaron Duran. Okay, so we've had the Duran incident, and now we have Rafi Devers. I don't know if it's a refusal to address the media, or he just he doesn't speak English. Uh, I think the whole thing was not. To, well, that's not true that, either. No, it is. Um. That's like so w- back in the day on? with Manny. It's like, oh, like Manny didn't talk after the game. Like Manny never talks. Like he shows did the up, front office. Like, oh, the, the highest paid player has to be the leader. Like that's bullshit. The highest paid player doesn't have to be the leader of the team. Rafael Devers is not. He's he's the I guess the face of the team, but he's not the leader of the team. He just shows up and he hits homers. That's what he does. He's never been a a media guy. I think the people that are talking about Rafael Devers not answering questions last night, it's the only people that are complaining about that are the writers themselves because they had to stay an extra hour waiting for him and he didn't end up answering any questions. Those are the only people that care about this. I don't care about this. He's never been a speak to the media guy ever. That's I, that, that's why my question is simple. Mm-hmm. There's no string attached to it. Mm-hmm. I'm just with the things that have gone on mm-hmm. in the clubhouse and seeing this and hearing reports that, you know, ownership has also not been happy about it for a while. I ask the question, is there a maturity or lack of no. maturity issue in the no. room? And no, he does that he play posts, into what's happening. He plays hurt. He shows up. He fucking had his best year this year. No, there's no, who cares if he talks, man, he never talked. He was the highest paid guy. He was paid to show up and hit. That was his job. That's Devers' job. Show up and hit. And he does it. Like, they, there, are, there are other guys that are going to stand in front of their locker. And like Xander Bogarts used to stand in front of his locker every single loss and answer questions. Even if he w- wasn't his fault why they lost a the game. Even if he had four hits and the Red Sox lost, there's Xander talking after a loss. There, you just Do have you- those guys. And, and Duran has been that guy, really. Um, so, yeah, it's not Devers' job. Do I what? Oh, no, you said Duran has been that guy. And I was yeah. going to ask you if, if you believe that a group can, can, can exist where a player of that caliber 
takes no responsibility for things like that. And that responsibility falls on somebody else. And maybe that individual doesn't play the same role that the other individual does. And at times, if one person is responsible for the messaging of the group, there could be a time where that message wasn't the message that this individual wanted to be out there or wasn't delivered the way. And then there could be conflict. And, and it's like, well, why do we have this conflict? Well, we have the conflict because I'm the only one who's willing to answer questions. They're asking me questions about my teammates. They're asking me questions about you and you're not answering them. So I have to answer them. And it's September. And this is why I'm answering them this way, because this is where we're at. Like that was my, that's where it's rooted is if you don't have somebody that is a la Derek Jeter going to be standing up and taking ownership of what's going on. Do you feel like you need that? Do you feel like the team could benefit from something like that? And if you don't have that as somebody who's been in the big leagues before, I know what that can do for a group. So that's why I asked the question, is there any concern? Because it sounds like Red Sox nation, Jared, collectively has not been having a very good time as of late. Mm -hmm. And if you're looking towards the future and how things can get better, I just asked a question as an outsider. I mean, we kind of talk about this with Mike Trout, right? Like during the the lockout when Mike Trout started spouting off, it's like Devers in spring training, he had plenty to say about ownership, right? Like he was he was saying what he had to say about the direction of the team in spring training, and it meant more because he doesn't talk much. Because he has like said Mike anything. Trout. Yeah. It's like Mike Trout, it's like this guy doesn't say much, but when he speaks up, it's like he must mean this shit because he's not someone that's that's so, talking to the media a bunch. But Duran. I think the difference is Devers is the highest paid player. Duran is statistically the best player. So if he's if he wants to take that leadership role, it's not like we're talking about 2022 Jaron Duran that he himself didn't even think he was good enough to be in the big leagues. Now he's the best player on the team and a top five player in Major League Baseball, at least this season. So I'm fine if that's the, the mouthpiece of the team because it's not like it's coming from some scrub. Uh, it's coming from a guy that wants that role. Whereas I think Devers has straight up told you, like, I don't want to be that guy. I just show up and I hit. That's what I do. <clears throat> Anyways. Thank you for asking. Yeah, I, I, I care. So friends are for. Yeah. Um, what's the latest on Otani 50-50? He's what, six back of homers and four? Yeah, six and four, four it's backs. happening. Yeah. Just look yeah, it. Just yeah. threw a casual three stolen bases on Monday after we recorded. No big deal. Mm. I, like, I, I think we're quickly understanding, and if you didn't already, you should. This is a dude who absolutely knows what the numbers are. He knows what's at stake. He knows what's in front of him. And very rarely do you get somebody that can pay attention to that stuff and legitimately chase these goals down. Like we're talking about a dude who is well aware that he's about to hit the 50 50 club, create the 50 50 club, will be the sole proprietor of the 50 50 club. He knows it. And he's showing you every single time he steps on the baseball field. What do I got to do today? All right. There's three of those. There's one of those. I got a month left. This is going swimmingly. See you in October. Like, I, I don't know that we're going to have, when it's all said and done, is Shohei Otani always going to be the answer when it comes to whose baseball career would you want to live out? Like you get to live out anybody's baseball career. I find it really tough <sighs> locking down another answer. Like, like I think I mean, give him let's 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 give him the ring. Dallas's internet's really tough. Yeah, we're almost give done. him the ring and then call it that. Yeah, I think I think there's always going to be a subset of fans, and I'm not even saying incorrectly so who will take the career of someone like Derek Jeter over what we're seeing from Otani. Obviously, this is spectacular in a way that Jeter never could be, 
But if you want your career to be a five time World Series champion uh, for the greatest franchise in the sports history in the biggest city in the country and arguably one of the most important cities in the world, uh, I, I won't begrudge you that either. Um, but yeah, I mean, in terms of the, the career that Not, I would want to what well, I was talking like more like a, like the individual because because everything that you just said about Jeter and that experience, I, I'm talking like, I guess, like more for the player side performing like I want like on the field, like if I get to live out as a hitter and live it out as a pitcher. Like, I want that. Like, sure. I'm a part of Cy Young yeah, races. Yeah, yeah. Sure. I'm a part of MVP races. I'm a part of uh, triple crowns. Like, you know, like, it, <laughs> you can't say this any way that doesn't make it sound like weird or clunky, but like Derek Jeter wasn't vying for a Cy Young and an MVP at the same time. But to your point, Derek Jeter is a five-time world champion playing a premium defensive position for one of the most heralded sports franchises in our world. No, no. He played a premium defensive position. Whether he played it premiumly or not, Jay, hey, we can have that discussion separately. Yeah. He didn't. No. <laughs> well, not saying it's going to be an Played argument. it poorly, actually. Yeah. <laughs> not much yeah. of a discussion, really. Some would say think. statistically the worst of all time. Some would say that. Mm -hmm. Mostly the statistics. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Jay, hey, do you have any uh, spicy nugs for us? Oh yeah, man! I got plenty that I didn't unload yet. Let's uh, let's fire it up here. Um, Please. All right. Um, Paul Skeens, uh, obviously huge fans here uh, at Baseball Is Dead, and me in particular. But you know, I I cover it all. Uh, not quite the same guy, despite five scoreless last night. Obviously, we could say he threw five scoreless. What's more interesting to me is that he also walked four batters in five innings, which means that he's walked seventeen batters. Over his last seven starts, uh, or 39 and a third innings, through his first 12 starts, or 74 and two thirds innings this season, he'd only walked 13 people. So maybe some level of fatigue setting in, maybe some level of adjustment period setting in. Obviously, if your adjustment period is five scoreless, everything's going to be just fine. But uh, not quite the you know the incredibly dominant force uh, that he was uh, through the first part of the season. Tyler Phillips, the first Phillies pitcher since Hall of Famer Jim Bunning. Uh, in 1970, to allow eight or more hits and six or more runs in a start of fewer than one innings pitch. Didn't make it out of the first inning uh, for Tyler Phillips. Tough break last night, but if his career is anything like Jim Bunning, um, he'll probably end up okay. Uh, it probably won't be, though. Uh, Nick Nastrini, uh, first White Sox pitcher since Ray Phelps in 1935 to rack up six or more walks and seven or more runs in a start of fewer than two innings pitched. Uh, he's the first pitcher to do so in MLB overall since Ricky Romero mm. in 2012. PD uh, guy. Busty. Was he? Did I make that Was up? Was he a PD guy? No, I'm thinking of... Uh, Ricky Romero? Yeah, let's no. be careful. Are you I thinking think about no. J.C. Romero? Yes. Was he a P yeah, he was. I yeah. should check that too before I start I believe that's just correct. J.C. Any or... old Romero. <laughs> uh, J.C. Romero suspended for 50 games in 2009. No, this mm -hmm. was uh, this was Toronto Blue Jays pitching prospect lefty Ricky Romero. Obviously, yeah. became more than a he prospect wore glasses. At some point, yeah, but yes, I believe yeah. he did for a stretch. Although, don't conf don't confuse Pete. him with uh, with Gustavo. What was it, Gustavo Chassin? Yeah, I remember him. Yep, he also was a lefty with glasses. I believe mm -hmm. um, David Peterson. Second start by a Mets lefty this season featuring 11 or more strikeouts, one or fewer walks, and one or fewer runs allowed, the other being delivered by Manaya. It's the first time since 1976 when Jerry Kuzman did so twice himself where the Mets have had multiple such starts from left-handed pitchers in the same season. Um, so some more Mets love there for the, for the people demanding it. Uh, Jackson Chorio is one home run away from a 2020 season. He hit two homers since the last time we podcasted. He'd be the third player age 20 or younger in MLB history to achieve that feat, along with Mike Trout in 2012, where he, he did much more than that. He went 30, 49, uh, and Veda Pinson, uh, in 1950. Sorry, what was it? 1959, he went 2021. So Churio, uh, his amazing 
uh, rookie season at 20 years old just continues to uh, to grow more impressive. Uh, a little a little uh, law butt nugget here for you. Lawrence Butler, eight homers and only three strikeouts over his last 11 games after he added another long ball last night. He's the first player in MLB since Vlad Jr. Uh, in to hit in 2021 to hit eight or more homers and strike out three or fewer times over an 11 game span. And he's the first A's player to do so since Rocky Colavito in 1964 for the Kansas City version of the team. Um, Francisco Lindor, MVP candidate, hit his 30th homer of the season on Tuesday. Uh, that's his fifth 30 home run season. That ties Ernie Banks for the second most 30 homer seasons by a shortstop ever behind only A-Rod now who had seven such seasons and one look ahead nugget here. Bowden Francis back on the bumpy today here on Wednesday. He's facing the Phillies this afternoon. For those of you who have not been paying attention to Bowden Francis over his last five starts, he has allowed nine hits in 34 innings pitched with four runs, four walks, and 39 strikeouts. That's a 1.06 ERA. And he is, in fact, the first right-handed pitcher in Major League Baseball history to have a five-start stretch featuring nine or fewer hits allowed and 39 or more strikeouts, uh, a minimum of 30 innings pitched. Uh, Blake Snell also did that earlier this season. They are the only two pitchers ever to do that. So, um, Bowden Francis and Blake Snell, uh, if you want to impress somebody at the bar uh, in 10 years from now about uh, very specifically five start stretches featuring nine or fewer hits and 39 or more strikeouts, uh, you'll blow some minds with that. Um, and then last thing, I'll do my final thought here now as well, if that's OK. I just want to urge people to go check out that week one promo calendar mm -hmm. from Underdog one more time, uh, because not only if you sign up with the promo code Jared. Do you get a chance at a thousand up to a thousand dollars back? But you also have a chance for today's Wednesday, right? So we talked about the three surprise discounts. We talked about what we didn't talk about is the vulture protection. Tomorrow with NFL kickoff, you get a 30% profit boost token for the NFL. On Friday, it's Packers Eagles. Got a mystery promo drop in there. Don't want to miss that. Saturday, college football week two. You know what happens there? Four college football discounts. Did he say four? I said four. Mm. And then Sunday, week one. And oh my gosh, it's a DAC free pick. Mm. Dallas, that is right up your alley, baby. So uh, obviously Dallas will want to check that out, but so will everyone else. And those are my final thoughts. Wow. Uh, Dallas, final thoughts? Um... Yeah, my final thoughts are going to be a little girthy than usual. Um, we can start with uh, the Nolan Ryan slander is just not going to fly oh, here. Uh, mm. Science matters. And yeah, he was definitely got 106. Well, you, you got to remember, right? Like, Jay, hey, tools, tools of the trade, those matter instruments that we're collecting data with and how they're used and all those matter. So you remember when they're measuring speed um, for Nolan Ryan, they were measuring the baseball crossing home plate and speed is measured today out of the hand of the pitcher. So just a little nugget for you there. And speaking of nuggets, the internet is a great place for incredible statistical analysis. Uh, the place that I have enjoyed finding some nuggets from folks who, who are really good at statistical analysis. And I had, I had a guy reach out to me because it's tough to find these sorts of nugs in my neck of the woods, I guess. Mm -hmm. You can call out graphics. Sometimes they pop up. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they fall through the cracks. But I'm not going to let that happen here. Over the 52 games coming into yesterday, we've had a lot of conversation about dynamic duos and trios and teammates that have been excelling. Well, the Yankees coming into yesterday, 26 and 26, and here's how their studs were stacking up. Aaron Judge, 342, 494 OBP, 
with a 717 slug. 41 runs, nine doubles, 20 homers, 42 RBI, and two stolen bases. Pretty good, huh? Well, Brent Rucker, Brent Rucker, he's hitting 342 himself, 419 on base, 679 slug. He also has 41 runs scored. Uh, he's also hit nine doubles. Uh, he has 18 homers, just two less than Aaron Judge. 46 RBI, which is four more than Aaron Judge, and six stolen bases, which is four more than Aaron Judge during that time. Lawrence Butler is hitting 325, 362, 696 during that time. 43 runs scored, 14 doubles, two triples, 18 homers, 45 RBI, and nine stolen bases. We'll compare that to the other guy in New York, Juan Soto, who at the time is hitting 278. That's that's not 325. And the 393 on base, the 610 slug, the 41 runs scored are, are not the 43 that Lawrence Butler has. Uh, the 15 doubles, one more than the 14 for Lawrence Butler. The one triple, though, is, well, it's one less than the two that Lawrence Butler has. Uh, the 17 homers, those are also really good, but it's still just one less than the 18 that Lawrence Butler had. The 45 RBIs for Lawrence Butler are 10 more than the 35 RBI for Juan Soto. And the one stolen base is really cute for Soto, but Lawrence Butler has eight more for a total of nine. Um, you want to go to the mound? I'd love to go to the mound. I'm glad you asked. Garrett Cole, 10 games oh, started, five and two, okay. 56 innings pitched, 3.05 ERA with a 1.250 whip. That's really good. J.P. Sears, over his 10 games started, he's 7-2, 61 and two-thirds innings pitched, 3.06 ERA, and a 1.054 whip, which, if you're doing the math, is better than Garrett Cole. Uh, Osvaldo Bido, 12 games started. Excuse me, in 12 games, eight of those starts, 5-2, and two, 49 innings, 3.31 ERA, and a whip of one on the dot. We'll go over to the Lesti in New York, Rodon. 10 games started, five and four, 52 and two thirds innings, 4.10 ERA and the 1.234 whip uh, across the board. None of those numbers are as good as B-Dows. And then Estes, the young 22 year old rookie, 10 games started, 11 total appearances, four and three, 60.2 innings pitch, 60 and two thirds innings pitch, excuse me, 3.56 ERA and a whip of 1.038. Pretty good. Nestor Cortez over there, third arm in that rotation, 10 games started, four and three, 54 innings, ERA 5.17, and a whip of 1.315. Yankees sit in second place, right in the middle of a playoff race, but what the A's and their young group has done, not only in the second half, but from the start to the end of this finish of this season, um, is some of the more exceptional growth I think that you're going to see in baseball. And it's not just from one dude or two. It's from many guys. The fight. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Jake's takes. Yeah. Just one more shout out to Kyle Schwarber, Chris Sale, Mookie Betts, the Mets. Um, Mm. So everyone seems to be having a lot of fun and that's what baseball is really all about. So (laughs) happy for everybody. I'm pumped. Jake just wants both teams to have fun. Yeah, tonight's gonna be a really fun episode of Section Ten, especially especially if the Mets keep it rolling too. You know, seven straight wins, maybe get into a playoff spot by the end of tonight. That's huge. That's what it's all about is is having fun and making it to the playoffs. So might have, to, I mean, might be time to start creeping in with some of that Durant, Devin Booker, Bradley Beal talk. Mm-hmm. That's about that time. Although expectations have diminished for that too, so. Not sure. Yeah. Championship window might have closed before it opened, unfortunately. That's all right. That's when it started. Yeah. They were the worst team in the NBA when Sogo started. That's true. That's true. You, you, ba- you raised them up. Yes. We were there on the ground level. All right, everyone. Um, baseballisdeadmerch.com. Hell yeah. Get that uh, Baines meter T in the mail. Get that Raise It Dallas Braden Buckos T sent T in the mail. It's uh, about to be fall. If you're one of the fortunate ones to get to watch your team in the playoffs, it's going to be a little chilly outside. Maybe a BID hoodie 
is uh is in your future i don't know it's up to you yeah and and stay tuned jay hay is going to be posting a link for all you listeners uh it's a it's a pretty big link it's a very helpful mm-hmm. link i'd be mm-hmm. i'd be on the lookout if jay hay doesn't post that thing by what is it nine is ten one if it's not posted by 1 30 p.m eastern standard time i would shoot him a dm whether DM's it's on closed. insta or 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 the or the tweet box, whichever, whatever you got to do, get a hold DMs. of him. Closed if you need a phone DMs. number, if you need a phone number, shoot me a DM. No, I'll, uh, got a ring on, got a ring on this finger. DMs close. That's right. Oh boy, did they used to blow up back in the day, though. That's right. <sighs> boy, do we know about it. All right, everyone. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. We'll be back tomorrow. I believe Joseph will be here tomorrow. Yes. Yep. Joey making his That's return. What the whispers are saying. Yeah. Yep. Some How are we going to do feud? Joe. Um, well, I mean, I guess, you know, if we're not going to do it like week link style, uh, I'll, I can volunteer to sit out so that Joe can play as the best player on the team. Um, you know, maybe I can just take a little breather. It's fine. It's up to you guys. It's really what you want to do because, you know, I did ask, I did ask the audience. The no, grave diggers. God. Hey, can you guys um, pull some stats for us on on all this? And um, it's a uh, Bush's cheat sheets at guard poll G U R G U A R D P U L L on Twitter. Um, Dallas left. That's because uh, the statistics <laughs> showed uh, total points. This is for Family Feud. It is five hundred and ninety eight points for Dallas. 781 points for me. Uh, average points per round, 99.67 for Dallas. That's big time. Um, 130.17 uh, for me. That's when we go first. That's when we go first. So maybe Dallas is better when you go second. 545 total points for Dallas when he goes second. That's, that's pretty damn good. It's hard to go second. 681 points for me when I go second. Yeah. Wow. Um, Average points for Dallas when he goes second, 90.83. Pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty good. Uh, Average points for me when I go second, 113.50. So, um, you know, Dallas keeps talking about, you know, he played on the actual family feud and, you know, he knows Steve Harvey, you know, godfather of his children and all that. Uh, but no matter who goes first or who goes second, uh, I am significantly better than Dallas. Um, That's just not even close to being true. Yeah, I mean, we just read the statistics. They don't lie, brother. Numbers and numbers. Uh, well, yeah, those are aggregated numbers that don't <laughs> mean much when you start mm-hmm. to think about mm-hmm. the value of points and the right. value of the questions. Like yeah. you can answer, you can answer one question yeah. I mean, that you, is worth like sixty four points. You start asking questions, and then you like, can get multiple life? questions what are wrong. <laughs> what is life? Jay, hey, you're done talking yeah. now. Yeah, so what, it's what? the numbers that matter, right? So yeah. if you I, answer one question, and that's worth a significant amount more yeah. than maybe the three questions that don't get that number. Spreadsheet. Yeah. Well, you see how it's it works. Like, and yeah, it's officially, like Dallas, and when Dallas we're answering questions like, "Oh, who's your favorite?" Favorite guy but, with two ears that has thrown pitches in baseball. I die, buddy. Back there's on, one of us. Uh, there's one of us that's a champ, and there's one of us that will never be a champ. May twenty third. That's, that's a fact. Is when Dallas had two hundred and forty three. Um, actually, no, that was me. Who's a champ? Show I hands. Do think, champ. I do Show think hands. it is interesting. I, I'm not ready Show to declare hands. one way or another, but I do find Are, it interesting none of you? that. You know, None Dallas you. was on Family Feud. Um, but you know, he's not he's even the been best there, Feud player, right? But, but he sanctioned. doesn't have the best stats so far. It kind of calls into question the whole, you know, did you play in the big league sort of argument? Like, like, oh, have you done this? Uh, I don't know if it matters. I'm not sure if it matters. Maybe this right. is a sign that if I just if coming one of us from just a guy who can't get a question like, out in fucking four seconds or less. Are you kidding, dude? Every no, instance. I'm not. Hold on. No, hold I'm on. not. So, no, Discord. I'm not. Discord. No, Discord. No, this is where I'm gonna ditch it. I said the fuck the rule. I said to hell Someone with the fucking rule. Tired. Oh, the only time the only tired. time the rule has tired. ever been violated is tired. when you can't get an answer out tired. and you start throwing stuff tired. around your house. Somebody on YouTube tired. check the video tape. Check the tape. 
Of my headphones let us know <laughs> if the timer has ever run out because I was asking a question or if the oh. timer has ever run out because Dallas's brain stalled out. Let us know. Let's, and let us know this. Has Jay Hay ever stopped using the timer because he knows he's wrong? I don't yes. have control over the timer. Yes, I don't have the control answer over to that it. is yes. I feel like you guys nope. are really yes. taken away from my moment here, which is that I'm the best <laughs> player. I mean, you can go at Jay Hay for long questions. Yeah, it's crazy. And the All the crazy fucking dissertations. Supposed professional. Yeah. The, After the war of 1812. The main uh, point we of had this a- segment was to Whoa, illustrate what? how I am Jay, the best. Jay, wake me up when you get done with the question. Wow. Thanks for st- just classic stealing the spotlight and you making it about me. Yeah. It's not about me. My questions are fine. They're great, actually. I got a lot of praise in Discord. Let's ma- We can do a whole other segment about me now. I got a lot of praise in well, Discord for my questions. Those don't stop, from what I understand. Well, they don't <laughs> stop when we stop recording, that's for sure. We... I do a whole other segment with my family about praise me, praise me. Um, that's good. I'll, maybe I'll release that pot someday. Yeah. All right, guys. Uh, we'll see you back here for Family Feud. Who's playing? Don't know. Don't know. We'll find out tomorrow. Uh, I'll tell you what. As You know what? I'll make the decision right now. As the resident champion... And as the only one who will ever hmm. be a Family Feud champion, hmm. I officially retire. Oh. Oh. What? So who's going to play on the days? I don't know. You here? guys all find out on oh, Monday. Is, is Dow is is quitting Monday because Monday he goes. has bad stats? <laughs> is that what's so. happening oh. here? Yeah. Not at all. No, no, no. So that's no. Crazy. This is This is a way for me to I'm just. I'm going to get passing on this break some news dallas retire second retirement second biggest retirement in dallas's career mm-hmm. maybe the biggest actually i'm I not sure how top. much fanfare there was when you retired i go out A's, on top oh uh, you went out second. same as for you when you came over here i think everybody celebrated that right you yeah hell yeah text. two texts wait when i came where <laughs> back oh yeah, yeah yeah that was very exciting yeah all right we'll see you tomorrow all right bye we don't Thank you.